speakers who are... All right. Uh, this week, we have two of our very own UMSI postdocs, Hannah Hoover and Kristen Barta. Um, Hannah will be presenting first and then uh, Kristen. So I'll, I'll introduce Hannah now and then I can introduce Kristen right before their talk. So Hannah is a recent PhD graduate from the Department of Economics at Florida State University. She was an American Economics Association Summer Fellow at the Federal Reserve Bank. And she also worked at the RAND Corporation in Santa Monica as a summer research associate. Her interests include behavioral economics, labor economics, and public policy. And she's currently working with Do Dr. Kripka as a postdoc research associate here at UMSI. So welcome, uh, Hannah. And uh, we'll be hearing a brief pre presentation, then there'll be opportunities for questions right after. Great, thanks, Julie. Um, so my name is Hannah, I'm coming from uh, Florida State, and what I'm presenting today is uh, something I've been working on for a while, so I'm still going through some pol uh, polishing and getting it ready for um, uh, submission for publication. So uh, the title is Asking for Too Much Evidence from New York City Taxi Cab Industry. So to motivate this paper, we know that it's been well demonstrated that defaults uh, drastically change consumer behavior. So this has been seen through a number of contexts. So um, organ donation choices when you go get your driver's license, uh, opt-in, opt-out policies for 401k contributions, um, health contract choice for gyms, it's been observed all over the place. Um, and recently, uh, given like electronic prompts, think about like Square or Clover, or even on uh, receipt slips from uh, restaurants, there's evidence that default effects in that domain and tipping exist as well. So for those set of papers, when they're looking at, okay, what is the influence of default suggestions or nudges in the tipping environment, there's all these possible mechanisms in which could be, which is influencing a, uh, the consumer to decide. Is it endorsement? Is it the reduction of cognitive costs? Is it something to do with reference points? So in the tipping literature, it's usually interpreted as indirect endorsement. So I think that everyone else is gonna select these options too. So you could think of this as a social norm, a descriptive social norm of what is the correct amount to tip. However, it kind of remains unexplored on how do consumers react to a change in the operative suggestions. So in these previous papers, they looked at a situation where there was no nudge or no default and they introduce the default or the nudge but we don't know what happens if you have a set of suggestions and then you change them over time um, and then it comes into an open question is it going to change the mechanism in which tip suggestions are operating through to influence decisions is it going to be perceived as an uh, indirect endorsement or is it going to be perceived as maybe a direct endorsement say coming directly from your server or your taxi driver or whoever is providing the good. So why, why are we interested in this? Well, passengers may react differently to changes in prompts rather than just their introduction. So there's this idea that if I were to give you a menu option today that was drastically above the descriptive norm of tipping, say I offer you uh, 20, 25, 30% when the norm is 20%, are you gonna perceive that as a direct endorsement saying it's coming from me, or even if you still think, oh, this is the descriptive norm, this is what everyone else is tipping. And that might influence the behaviors of the passengers themselves. And thinking uh, more broadly, if we understand how people perceive these changes, it could inform uh, UX designers or policymakers, say in these nudge units about the best practices of how to implement these nudges or defaults and you know what would happen if we were to change them so, you know sometimes people want your time so knowing uh, how defaults work in a variety of contexts is really important so some hypotheses what happens if we increase the tip suggestions 
So there's evidence of a trade-off between average level and the propensity to participate when manipulating prompts. So this is observed in the voluntary contributions literature and in also the tipping literature. So if you increase tip suggestions, on average, tip, in, tip amounts and the number of contributions increase, but the individual propensity to tip or to donate decreases. So you have this kind of trade-off effect where average levels are increasing, but you have less participants. And it's same, it goes the other way as well. So if you make defaults or tip suggestions really low, more people are gonna donate or tip, but on average, it's gonna be lower. However, there might be a point, and this is observed in um, the donation literature, where the signal is just so large that individuals don't think it's comparable. So this is the situation in where I say, do you want to tip like 30%? And I think that's not reasonable. That doesn't look like what the norm is. I'm not going to respond to it. And then there might actually be a case where I think it is a direct endorsement or some type of manipulation on behalf of whoever is giving the default prompt and might have this negative reactionary effect, or I'm going to tip even less or maybe not tip at all. So we have three possible cases in which there is a, this trade-off effect, there's a, no, a null effect, or there's this negative reactionary effect. So these are the types of things that one might expect if you were to increase tip suggestions. So to give you an overview, uh, I'm going to explore how changes in the default options, so those tip suggestions, influence consumer behavior, setting where consumers can either select a default or manually enter a tip amount. Um, and to do this, I look at data at the New York City taxi industry, where I identify uh, for the both the timing and the payments, timing of the payment stream installations and variation in the technology vendor in taxis. And as an overview, I find that higher tip suggestions do result in increased tip amounts of about 57 cents per fare, and these estimates are robust to uh, a slurry of uh, specifications and robustness checks that I can't go through all today, but uh, they're there in my paper. So to give you a little bit of context and timeline, by the end of 2008, a majority of the New York City taxi cabs are outfitted with this, what they call technological improvements. So this just meant that you could sit in the back of the taxi cab and you swipe your card. There's a prompt that comes up that tells you um, you know, how much it was your fare, how much would you like to tip, and it, it just made it so you could process credit cards in the taxi cab. Um, so prior to that, a majority of uh, taxi rides were cash only. Uh, so there's two predominant taxi uh, technology vendors in the market at this time. One is called Creative Mobile Technologies, which I'll call CMT, and the second is Veriphone, which I'll also call as VTS. And importantly, the two vendors varied in the screen format and the suggested tip level. So Verifone suggested tips of two, three, and four dollars for fares below fifteen dollars, and fares above fifteen dollars, they suggested tip amounts of uh, twenty, twenty-five, and thirty percent. So I highlighted the tip suggestions in the red box. It's a little hard to see, but you have the dollar amount corresponding to each tip percentage and the tip percentage is listed above the dollar amount. So it goes from 20, 25, and 30 across the screen. Now for Creative Mobile Technologies, CMT, they initially suggested 15, 20, 25% and up to 2010 um, and until the, the end of 2010. And then in the beginning of 2012, around February, they switched to a higher tip prompt of 20, 25, and 30. So these tip buttons are highlighted in red, and they're similar in the sense that the highest option is at the top and it goes to the lowest. So I'll talk a little bit more about the data. I'm gonna use ride level data on all taxi rides in New York City and surrounding counties from February 1st, 2010 to December 31st, 2011. So I'm looking at the time period right in, where right in the middle there's the change that CMT increase, increases their tip suggestions. And this data is particularly rich. I have information on which 
technology vendor was in each cab. I had a unique medallion number. So that is uh, the number that identifies the physical taxi cab. I have a driver's license number for the taxi. This is known as a hack license. Every taxi cab driver needs one in New York City. I have date, time, and coordinates for a pickup and drop off. And I have trip time in seconds and trip distance in miles. So using all of these uh, variables, I can control for things like you might concern of like trip quality. Um, and then I have all everything relating to the payment of the fare. So the fare amount, tolls, tax surcharge, rate code, that will tell me if it was say like a weekend surcharge or a holiday surcharge and payment method. So I have to do some sample restrictions. First of all, I condition only on card observations. This is because cash uh, tips aren't recorded and if you're paying by cash, you're not going to be treated by that prompt, the screen. And I exclude observations in which the sum of the fare total tax and surcharge was less than $15. So remember how Verifone varied their screen by if it was less than uh, $15, it was two, uh, two, three, and four tip suggestions. I just want to make that a clean comparison. Um, there's this paper called Hagen Pachi that did a really nice data refinement process where they you know, went through and systematically um, excluded data that just didn't make sense. So if trip distance was negative or passenger count was zero. Um, so I follow what they did. And I, using um, these uh, longitude and latitudes for pickup and drop off points, I can merge hourly weather statistics and mean household income by census tracts. So um, one idea was I was exploring maybe is there kind of like heterogeneity by income. Uh, and there's been some papers looking at the supply, taxi supply during the rain and it affects consumer demand. So I control for weather effects as well. So just doing this process, I uh, lose a lot of data. I go from 300, uh, yeah, 331 million to more like 2.5 million. And then for a certain specification where I just look at airport originating rides, I lose about half of that. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit now about why that's important. If you think there's any kind of sorting going on between passengers and drivers that's not observed, uh, for this specification, I focus only on airport originating rides as when you go to the airport, you file into a queue, you don't have really a decision about which cab you're gonna go with and you can't see or, or predict which one is going to be outfitted with which um, technology. So that's like a robustness check. Okay, so I have aggregated the um, outcome variables of interest by month and by technology vendor and plotted it over time. So the blue dash line is creative, creative mobile technologies, the solid red line is Verifone, and on figure four on the left hand side we have tip amount. And the vertical red line is the, the treatment date. So when did CMT switch to those higher tipping prompts? So just doing some rough estimates, looking at it, we can see that tip amounts increase significantly for CMT after that date. Uh, figure five on the right-hand side is tip percentage, and we see it jump up to the same levels as Verifone. Zero tip frequency is on the left-hand side. Um, so this is the idea that is there going to be this negative reactionary effect for passengers where they're going to punish drivers for increasing tip suggestions. And we just looking at the aggregated statistics, it doesn't look like there is a clear jump for CMT. And figure seven on the right-hand side, default option frequency, uh, CMT is trending above Verifone, and then it drops off significantly after the treatment date. Okay, my empirical strategy, I do a difference in difference regression where I control for vendor type, CMT. I have post T, which is an indicator that just says if this is after the switch of the higher tipping prompts. And then I have that interaction term for the difference in difference. So that is going to be capturing 
that the beta-3, the effect of increasing tip suggestions. Um, and I tried to throw in all the control variables I possibly could, so fair amount of time, um, tax fixed effects, hour interacted with weekday, monthly and year fixed effects, um, everything I could. <laughs> all right. And uh, as another thing to explore, I wanted to see if there's any kind of dynamics to this. So I included a bunch of different monthly indicators. And instead of having just a pre and a post period, I have a period for each month to see if there's any kind of like diminishing over time or if there's a potential lead up. Um, so it's the same specification. Yeah. So here are my results. I'm just reporting the difference in difference variable. Um, I have all observations. And then if you're concerned about the passenger sorting or the you know, driver sorting, uh, I also include just JFK and, or LaGuardia um, observations. And there's a significant effect of increasing tip amounts by 57 cents. Um, the mean dependent variable is just what is the average tip amount for CMT in the pre-period. And then I report the percent change. So we can see that tip amounts increase about 7% for fares um, and 17% for LaGuardia, but the, the number of observation is significantly lower. Uh, for tip percentage, we see the same thing. Uh, tip percentage increases by one percentage point, or if you're looking at the mean dependent, about 6%, 6 7%. Probability of selecting the default option, we see that it decreases by 13 percentage point or 20, 20%. And interestingly, we see that the probability of selecting a zero tip is not significant. And even if it were significant, it could be estimated as precisely zero. It's very, very small. So this is tip amount conditional on selecting a default option. So for these observations, I say, OK, if you selected a default option, how did it change your, you know, your overall tip amount? And it increases by $1.67. And interestingly, when I look at just manual amounts, so tip amounts conditional that you selected a manual amount, tip amounts increase by 32 to 50 cents, which is an increase of about five to 8%. So it's interesting in the sense that the only thing that's changing here is the prompts themselves. So this could be indicative that people are inferring the indirect endorsement or the social norm of tips in the sense that even if you're selecting a manual tip, you're going to tip higher because you think the norm is now higher. So just a summary of my results, increased tip suggestions, Increase the tip amounts between 58 and $1.93 per fare and increase tip percentages by 1.7 to 2.21 percentage points, depending on which sample. And there's moderate evidence that increasing default, default tip suggestions increase manual tip amounts by 5 to 8%. Um, for this, I did a back of the hand calculation and I saw that cab drivers typically complete 20 fares per shift with an average of 2.5 five fares per hour, which will result in an increase of 78 cents in the hourly wage. And going by the census reported hourly wage for taxi cabs, it's about 5.35%. Um, and the probability of selecting the default option dropped. However, the probability of selecting a zero to remain statistically insignificant. So we didn't find this reactionary effect of people uh, tipping less or deciding not to tip at all. So this is the results of the event study. There seems to be a, a significant jump, but it's stable. It's not going down over time. So this is kind of indicative that maybe switching prompts could increase wages without any kind of like dynamic effects being evident. Yeah, and here's the same thing. I'm looking at probability of selecting a zero tip for airport originating rise, JFK on the left, and LaGuardia on the right. 
and it's just not precisely estimated for either of them. Uh, Hannah, could you um, start to wrap up in the next minute? Yeah. Yeah, so one of the robustness checks that I do is that sometimes cab drivers might switch tabs or technology companies over time. Um, I remove them, doesn't change the analysis. So in conclusion, I found that tip suggestions cause increase in tip amounts um, and it will increase wages for cab drivers. There's no effect on frequency of zero tips and cab drivers should have a particular interest in how these, uh, how tip suggestions are being presented. So what do I contribute? I find mild evidence that defaults are being interpreted as indirect endorsement. So the social norm in the context of tipping, there might exist an optimal tip menu, but as far as I saw in the data, we haven't reached that point of negative reaction. And this could potentially be a way to uh, increase tips within this range. Great. So do we take questions now? Uh, yes, we'll have, um, how about like five, six minutes for questions. And you can just speak up or post in the chat. So Oliver posted, how do you think these results would apply to other jobs that involve tipping like servers, bartenders, et cetera? Right, I think that's really interesting because there's a, such variation in tipping policies. So um, when doing this research, I found out that there's something called the tipped minimum wage, which is actually below the federally minimum wage and you make up until you get to that minimum wage using your server's tips. So if that was well known in a certain context and uh, say I was a business owner and I am doing increasing tip suggestions, that could be perceived as say the direct endorsement by the server size in the sense that you are subsidizing wages for that person. So I think it's really interesting. Um, I wouldn't extend these results to that context. Um, but yeah, and I have one paper looking at uh, looking at Twitter data. So I'm sure you've gone to like a coffee shop where they have these buttons and you press one. And I, I have similar results there as well. So uh, it's promising, but I don't want to extend this too far. Awesome. Uh, there's another question by Vincent. Great talk, Hannah. A question that might be slightly out of scope is, in other service industries, there has been discussion of moving away from tipping as means of providing livable wage, as alluded by above question in your response. What is the atmosphere in the cab industry? Yeah, so that's um, really interesting. And when I was first getting into this data, um, the way that the whole New York City cab industry works is that you have to buy a taxi cab or lease it out. And if you were to buy a taxi cab and get that medallion, it's really expensive. Like I am not lying, it's in the millions of dollars, okay? And it's, you can track it over time. And once Uber came into the market and Lyft and all these other ride sharing services, the cost of a medallion, you know, plummeted and it just effectively ruined these taxi cab owners' lives. So and, and for this particular industry, I think it's really struggling. Um, these people lease out cabs by like a flat rate and have to make it up over time. So they're facing a really competitive market. Um, there are different things going on that they're, they're talking about. So right now um, it's a fixed fare. You know, you pay your fare by say your time or by how fast you're driving versus say like Uber or Lyft, they use dynamic pricing models to really um, maximize the, pot, the revenue. Um, so we'll see what's going to happen. I think they're they're trying to compete with them. Uh, there's like an app that you can use to call um, New York City taxi cabs, but it's it's not priced efficiently. I, I know I didn't talk about uh, at least um, tips, but that's at least what the industry is like right now. Awesome. Um... Does anyone else have questions from the audience? So Cassidy 
has a question. You mentioned Uber and Lyft, but I'm also curious as to whether this would extend to other services like DoorDash, which you, uh, which asks you to tip before the service is completed. I'm not sure if you've read any literature about that. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, sometimes it's, there's one other paper that looks at a service similar to DoorDash where it's like you drop off your laundry and they do your laundry and then you can tip for them. And they, they're finding things very similar where they're influenced by tip suggestions, but it's not this kind of like, oh, I, you know, this isn't related to the service. Um, and there's been some uh, like qualitative studies that found that in terms of motivations for tipping, it's not so much to uh, ensure quality service, but either um, feeling of like gratitude. So, or maybe my self perception or I'm just the type of person who tip and also wanting to adhere to this norm. So I, in, in the question of how does it vary by, you know, is service rendered before or after? I don't think it's gonna vary that much. Um, so good question though, I haven't thought about that. Awesome. Um... I think we can go over and switch to Kristen now. And while we're doing that, if, if anyone wants to ask like one last question while we're switching. Great, I can see your slides. Okay, so let's welcome Kristen Barta. Kristen joined UMSI oh, good uh, as a postdoc this fall and is working with Nazan Delibi on products regarding social media, marginality, visibility, and social support. She holds a PhD in communication from the University of Washington and her research explores how marginalized groups such as women migrating to the US and sexual assault survivors navigate disclosure, decision-making processes, and social support exchange on social media. And she joins us remotely from California. So welcome, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, before I start, can everyone hear me okay? Volume's good? Yep. Awesome. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Um, as Julie mentioned, I'm Kristen. I work with Nazan Dalibi, um, and my work looks at intersections between or among uh, social support, social media, and marginality. Um, my talk today is a bit more of an introduction um, to my, my work. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about my approach to research, um, examples of collaborative projects, uh, my doctoral work, and then what I'm working on at SI. So um, I wanna start with just my approach to research more broadly because I think it's a good introduction to what I do, how I do it, and why I study the things that I do. So that's just a nice reminder for myself. <laughs> um, but I am a communication scholar by training. Um, my research interests are at the intersection of communication and technology studies and interpersonal communication traditions. Um, within this kind of intersection, I take a subject subjectivist epistemological stance, <clears throat> excuse me, um, which is just to say that I think individuals who use tools like social media are the experts on what those tools mean and how they help or hinder them in navigating their experiences. Um, so I imagine this orientation is also informed by my professional experience um, working as a domestic and sexual violence advocate and educator. Um, and my research interests are also informed by uh, feminist and critical approaches to scholarship. And while my work doesn't always explicitly engage these frameworks, considerations of power and positionality do inform how I approach um, topics like vulnerability and marginality, as well as how I seek to engage with participant communities. Uh, so within this orientation, um, my interests uh, and research kind of center around the broad question or questions, how do and how can we make social media work as sites of social connection and social support for communities for whom they were not explicitly designed. So as people in this audience may be aware, social media spaces um, can embed and perpetuate social biases such as racism, sexism, and homophobia that can re-marginalize or otherwise render invisible communities who could potentially really benefit from social media as spaces for support and connection. Um, my explorations of these questions have emphasized qualitative methods of inquiry, um, social support as a conceptual lens, um, and social media affordances as framework for understanding social media spaces. Um, so I'll quickly walk through kind of two examples to speak to these concepts. 
The first is um, the Migrant Women in Technology Project. Um, this was a collaboration with Maggie Fezenmeyer and Robin Perry um, that was supported by the Center for Technology Society and Policy at UC Berkeley in their high school. Um, it's a fantastic center. Um, they do kind of micro grant work, so I highly recommend checking that out for any students right now. Um, and this project had two parts. Um, one focused on the experiences of women who had recently migrated to the US, um, specifically Seattle and the San Francisco Bay Area, um, and kind of their experiences in culturation, um, what their social support needs were, how technology facilitated support, both in maintaining connections to their home country and building new networks in the US, and what the limits of those strategies were. The second part focused on the community of service providers, um, nonprofit service providers who engage with immigrant and migrant communities in sectors like legal aid, health, and community resources. Um, we were interested in what their technology use looked like, um, kind of what their, uh, their usage afforded their, their organization and work, and what constraints persisted. So bringing these groups together kind of gave us a richer understanding um, from multiple perspectives of the barriers um, to support access and provision via technology. And I'm happy to talk more about our findings there if that's of interest. Um, but the second example I want to talk about is um, a collaboration with Katie Pierce, Dana Donahoe, and Jessica Vitak that looks at how new brides in Azerbaijan use closed Facebook groups to navigate issues related to infertility and reproduction. Um, this is in a cultural context that is very patriarchal and very pronatal. Um, the Aleens, as they're called, can experience rather extreme emotional and social isolation from their natal family and friends um, following marriage. There's not a lot of sex education that's available. Um, so informational isolation persists as well. And these brides are under tremendous pressure to conceive and produce a male child and failure to do so can result in very severe consequences. Um, in the West, I think we and myself included tend to frame social media as supplementing offline sources of social support. But this is a context where those offline sources are by and large just not available. Um, so social media becomes the only access point um, for emotional, informational, and network support on these topics. Um, and so in this case, considering the context and situation of this group of users kind of affects what we see as outcomes of use. So those are kind of two brief examples. Again, I'm happy to talk more about those in questions. Um, but I'd like to shift now to talk a little bit about my dissertation and findings there. Um, so as Julie mentioned, I completed my PhD in communication at the University of Washington in 2019. Um, I was advised by Gina Neff, who's now the Oxford Internet Institute. And my dissertation looked at how sexual assault survivors kind of navigate social media spaces for disclosure purposes. I understood sexual assault as a potentially stigmatized experience. So that lens of stigma was also informative here. Um, and drew on communication privacy management theory, which uses a boundary metaphor to think about how survivors saw the risks and rewards associated with disclosing in a public social media space and how they drew those boundaries around their disclosures. So public here refers to like a public profile as opposed to a private page or a closed group. Um, and more specifically, what I was interested in looking at um, were you know, what were the motivations and goals of survivors who chose to disclose publicly on social media and how did they make sense of their disclosures and what those disclosures did for them? Um, what is the role of um, kind of social media in broader systems of coping and social support, particularly in connecting that to offline um, systems of support? Um, the technological characteristics or the factors particular to different social media spaces, um, such as visibility, which we'll talk more about in a second, and how those informed survivors' decisions to disclose publicly. Uh, and finally, what are the characteristics of the networks of users who are just engaging with public sexual assault disclosures on social media? So to respond to these questions, I did a social network analysis of 23 hashtags pertaining to sexual assault on Twitter. Um, and these kind of fell across three categories, one being um, identity oriented tags, so hashtag sexual assault survivor, uh, more descriptive tags, so like hashtag sexual assault, and advocacy related tags, so hashtag support survivors, for example. Um, this network analysis also provided kind of a way of sampling um, participants and recruitment, um, and so I did interviews with uh, 27 self-identified sexual, um, sexual assault survivors to respond to these questions as well. To give you a sense of the findings um, and responding to these questions, um, 
Participants reported myriad motivations for disclosure, and that's not uncommon. Um, there's a rich literature on disclosure motivation. Um, I've cited a few of those below. Um, and these are some of the categories that those motivations fell into. Um, I also used um, uh, Nas and Andrea Forte's um, disclosure decision factor framework to help think through and organize these findings. So thank you for that. Um, and what really stood out as unique in this space um, was the prominence of supporting others as a motivation. Um, we often think about disclosure as a mechanism for seeking or receiving support, where you have to ask for help to get it. Um, and some of that was present, but more often than not, um, participants referenced wanting to support others who had experienced assault or were processing trauma um, stemming from assault. So this may be um, uh, because of this emphasis on public disclosure where being visible to others was a particular interest and it may also be a function of who felt comfortable talking to me about their experiences. So in terms of how um, social media connects to offline systems of support, um, there are a couple different purposes that came up in um, interviews. Um, one, social media augmented offline support. Um, an example of this is someone who responded to their therapist's suggestion. So the therapist as a source of support, um, their therapist suggested writing a letter to their rapist. And this person actually took that a step further, recorded a YouTube video of them speaking very directly to the person who assaulted them posted it publicly, and even kind of hoped that person might see it. Um, social media also supplemented offline support systems, and this was especially the case where offline systems were very disappointing. Um, so one person reported that they couldn't find good services in their area or were very unsatisfied with what they did find. And so they turned to Tumblr actually to kind of create their own space for processing and working through and using some of the tools that are available online. Um, and then eventually turn that kind of publicly facing um, as a means of providing support to other people. Um, social media were also treated as totally separate from offline systems. Um, and we see this also in instances of like context collapse and things like that, where some participants sought out spaces that were totally detached from their other networks. They were like, I have a separate account, I have a Finsta, none of my friends know about it, and that's where I write about this. Um, and finally, social support or social media provided kind of advocacy spaces for supporting others. Um, so, uh, for example, one participant said, um, I feel like now that I'm strong enough, I can be more of a voice for the people that are where I was um, a year and a half ago. We don't have to, um, they don't have to stand up and say, right, that's harmful to say that I can be that person to stand up for them and say that. Um, and so really kind of being who you wanted to see in that space. Um, and an interesting association that some of these examples speak to is the influence of therapy on public disclosure. And I can't prove it from this study, but um, a sizable amount of participants did mention seeking therapeutic services either prior to or concurrent with disclosing online. And that may not be surprising, right? We think about processing things before you're comfortable speaking about them. But when we think about um, to whom therapy is an available resource and to whom it's not, we get a different picture of for whom online public disclosure may be viable and helpful. Um, it may also inform who gets to be a visible survivor on social media and who other survivors see as visible examples of survivorship. Um, the next slide contains a little bit of profanity, so just a heads up about that. Um, but in thinking about the ecology of social media spaces, um, participants associated different platforms with different utilities, and these were informed by both audience considerations, right, who their networks were in those spaces, and materiality considerations. Um, as one person who had engaged with sex work um, by choice, by coercion, or by circumstance, um, said, the saying used to be that you tweet your and you Facebook your family. So pretty clear distinctions in utility and networks there. Um, and this, of course, supports findings from other scholars like Zhan Zhao, Cliff Lampy, and Nicole Ellison, who have noted how usage norms and materiality shape perceptions of social media spaces. Um, as I mentioned, I use a, 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 sorry, a socio-technical affordances framework um, to think through these questions. And uh, affordance here speaks to the opportunities for action that are made available um, by interactions between an actor um, in pursuit of a goal and an object or a device. Um, so affordances shift depending on actors' goals, um, as well as the materiality of a tool, or in this case, a platform. 
Um, and given the emphasis on publicness in this project, visibility became a key affordance here. Um, so visibility is kind of quite literally defined in um, scholarship as like the degree to which you are seeable or perceivable by another person. Um, and so depending on motivation, participants drew on a number of tactics, features, or other affordances to strategically manipulate or increase or constrain disclosure visibility. Um, so again, some of those um, strategies look similar to things about like context collapse where people kind of use lists to segment audiences to block other users or create alternative accounts or platforms um, like Finstas. Um, and others relied on more specific platform specific features. Um, so for example, using the functionality of hashtags on Tumblr. Um, if you reblog something on Tumblr, the tags that you've provided don't get reblogged with it. Um, and so tags on Tumblr were a way to disclose in a way that was unshareable. Um, it was really located on your or dash or your profile. Um, in terms of the network analysis of hashtags, um, this provide another angle from which to think about visibility. Um, and in affordances work, hashtags are often thought of as boosting visibility by affording searchability and association. Um, so if you search a hashtag on Twitter, right, the results are kind of all the content that has that tag. In analysis, though, um, these 23 tags returned thousands of tweets and only a very small percentage um, were coded as being disclosive or as really identifying the poster as being a survivor or victim of assault. Of those disclosive tweets, um, the vast majority were self loops or isolates, meaning that nobody replied, nobody retweeted, nobody really visibly engaged with them. Um, but in talking to survivors who use these tags, it became clear that this type of connection maybe wasn't the goal um, or maybe wasn't indicative of success. Um, and so this contrasts a little bit with something more like Me Too, where it really is about kind of a large visible network of people who are engaging with that tag. Um, data collection this project started prior to kind of the Me Too moment. Um, and so that wasn't considered as, as part of this. Um, so as I said, yeah, uh, that kind of connection maybe wasn't the goal um, or wasn't indicative of success. Um, and while hashtags did afford searchability and visibility and that was desired, the conversations that resulted were invisible. Um, so participants reported kind of low visible engagement, but a fair amount of engagement via other channels. Um, so through DMs, through emails, through texts, depending on how they respond to the person. Um, and reciprocal disclosure in particular seemed to occur through these less visible channels. So participants who used hashtags in this way were not necessarily seeking to create like a public conversation that branched from a tagged post, but rather were seeking to appear visible to others as a way of signaling, hey, I'm here, you can talk to me. Um, and so the contribution here is almost more methodological in that either method, right, an analysis of hashtags or interviews would be insufficient um, to describe this system and bringing them together, we kind of really see the impact of multiple modes of visibility on disclosure. Um, okay, so this project focused on, on visibility and stigma and touched on marginality in some interesting ways. Um, and I'm hoping to kind of extend that thinking in my present work um, and extend our understanding of visibility of um, and, and vulnerability by thinking about social media as sites of identity expression um, and digging deeper into those questions of who gets to be visible as themselves on social media and for whom does visibility of self, right? Totally aside from a stigmatized experience, um, who does that continue to be risky for um, and where, right? In which, which spaces is that true? Um, so to start addressing these questions, I'm currently conducting exploratory interviews to kind of build out this concept of visibility of self on social media and to kind of better understand how social media users themselves think about what it means to be visible on social media. Um, I'm also currently working on a project that touches on um, TikTok and kind of norms around TikTok and how authenticity um, comes constructed through kind of this perception of TikTok as a fun platform where you can just be you. Um, so that's what I got. Thank you so much for, for um, attending. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions about any of these projects. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you, Kristen. So if anyone has a question, you're welcome to unmute or just uh, paste in the chat. And I can read them out. 
<clears throat> well, I have a question. Um, thanks for the talk. I, um, I was wondering if you could uh, tell us a little bit more about um, the interviews that you did uh, for your dissertation work were clearly really um, uh, probably emotionally challenging in some um, aspects. So, um, uh, and I know that some students on this call would uh, probably appreciate knowing about how you approach that, um, uh, you know, on, on the one hand doing the interviews, but also on the other hand uh, for you as a researcher. Um, yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, there is a large body of work on um, kind of engaging with sexual assault survivors in research. Um, and so to kind of guide um, best practices there, I look to that, um, that work to think through how do people who have participated in this research feel about it? What would they want? Um, um, I think being very forthcoming in what I was attempting to do with the study was also helpful um, there wasn't any deception interviews. It was very much, um, I want to hear your experiences and your thoughts about this. I also made it clear that I wasn't going to ask them to describe experiences of assault. Um, it was very focused on social media. Um, and I think that helped in that regard as well. Um, that being said, these interviews were still very challenging. Um, uh, just the, the, the weight of receiving those stories um, did kind of impact me in some ways. And so I think, um, spacing out data collection helped in that regard, making sure that I had space for myself to kind of process and um, recover is the wrong word, but um, maybe kind of just sit after each interview, um, you know, rather than doing back to back or um, even or sequential on different days. Um, and so being kind of kind to of myself in terms of how long that um, data collection took was I think really important there. Um, for people who want to engage with um, kind of stigmatized experiences or difficult topics, I would also really suggest keeping kind of um, an interview journal or a diary um, and just making note of your thoughts and emotional reactions um, after each interview um, and thinking through how is this impacting me? How am I still carrying these stories? And how is that affecting how I'm asking these questions or engaging with other participants? Um, and just having a space to kind of do that own disclosure work um, can be really, really impactful. Thank you. We have another question from Oliver. Mm -hmm. Great talk. I'm really interested in your upcoming work about authenticity in social media based on what you've seen in your data so far. To what extent do you think that authenticity is achievable for participants online? Yeah, I think this is a really interesting question. Um, and I know that Oliver has done some work on this as well. Um, when I say authenticity, I'm thinking of it very much as a social norm. Um, so a, a version of kind of socially palatable authenticity. Um, what I think is really interesting about TikTok though, is that this perception of, right, just be you, do what you wanna do, don't do trends if you don't want to, um, supports kind of something interesting about, um, social media, what we think of as like a social positivity bias. Um, so often on social media, right, only the good things are, are what kind of get posted or highlighted. Um, but on TikTok, it seems like there is a space for authenticity to also refer to emotional rawness or this idea that you can kind of just like put your camera on and be crying with the sound happening in the background and that is still coded as authentic. Um, and so kind of the, the space there to present both positive and negative authenticity is really interesting. And I'm trying to dig more into how the affordances of TikTok um, kind of perceptions of anonymity or the way that association works in that space, how those affordances kind of contribute to or support that, no, that norm and um, uh, range of expression. I'll, I'll jump in if that's okay. Can you hear me? Of course, yeah. yeah okay. Um, so just, it's kind of tags on to Oliver's question. So authenticity, so in, online dating, I'm thinking of authenticity as both um, for both parties, right? That I want other people to be honest and authentic, but then I also want to present myself authentically so that someone, you know, loves me for who I am and the kind of positive outcomes that we know happens um, under those circumstances. So I guess I would just love to hear you talk about when you're thinking about authenticity. Is it from the 
standpoint of the like the sender or the receiver or both mm. and then also I'm also curious with kind of playful like just thinking about the affordances of online spaces and this idea that we can we have the ability to present ourselves in ways that are fundamentally different than face-to-face -face. so like you know bunny rabbit ears or whatever so is that um I mean, I, I'm just I'm just curious about how to think about those types of filters. Is it that um, it makes us uh, less, um, you know, less authentic because, of course, those aren't my real ears, or more authentic because I'm able to express myself with kind of a wider set of of cues? Yeah, that's a good question um, or questions. And in terms of your your second question, I would say that it's. Um, it would still maybe be coded as authentic if it's something that comes across as you very much enjoying that presentation. Um, so some people commented on um, the ability to kind of explore with cosplay um, or like costuming, right? And kind of showing off that part of themselves. And in terms of it being authentic, right? If it's like an authentic hobby, um, showing off things that you're proud of still gets read as authentic. Um, and going back to your, your first question, um, I think it's a little bit of a mix. Um, people are looking to social cues, they're looking for responses as kind of indicators of how they are being read or how they are coming across as authentic. Um, some people commented on, you know, yeah, I was, I was trying to be uh, funny and it just came off as awkward and people commented on that and they said, yeah, we, we see that you're awkward. Um, but when you do X, Y, or Z, right, we really liked that. And so pivoting content to, to that um, was then read as being more authentic. Um, I think TikTok's a little bit different in that um, it seems, not in every case, but it seems largely disconnected from other networks. It's maybe harder to find people you actually know. It can be more pseudonymous. It's just harder to find people through searching um, on TikTok. So, uh, in comparing it to online dating, I don't think there's an expectation that you're going to meet that person offline. Um, so I don't think there's an expectation that they're going to compare how you present in this space to your offline authentic self. Um, but I think like things like uh, social cues about enjoyment or, um, right, you can kind of be goofy and be silly. And if it like comes off as something that you actually are comfortable with doing, it gets coded as authentic. Um, so there's a back and forth there. Um, and I think, yeah, filters are interesting. Um, I think people kind of test filters also. And so those like responses of like, oh, I don't like that. Or, oh, this is awesome. I'm like amazing. Those kind of expressions <laughs> also get coded as authentic because they are seen as genuine reactions. Um, so. Yeah, interesting. I think there's also this question of authentic implies that I know myself. Mm -hmm. And that, anyway, there's a whole nother set of kind of questions around self-knowledge and, and also different kinds of identity being salient in different spaces. And is it possible to be, to say almost oppositional, pre to present in totally different ways in two different spaces and be authentic in both, even though on the face of it, they may appear to be um, op opposite of one another. Absolutely. And I think a little bit of that is coming through in the interviews I'm doing now where people are very deliberate about segmenting parts of their identities that they share in different spaces. And that's of course also informed by, by the norms, right? Um, people feeling like they can't be funny or silly on Twitter because that's a professional space and how that highlights aspects of identity or downplays other aspects. Um, so yeah, very, very complicated. <laughs> cool. Uh, we have another question from Irene. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious about the project with the Azerbaijani brides. How could you talk? Could you talk more about your research questions and findings? I'm especially curious about as to whether there are informal networks that provided sex ed and fertility info prior to the advent of social media. Like, is there an accompanying decline of local communal support, or was that just never there to begin with? Yeah. Um... Those are good questions and I, I want to just kind of um, disclaim that um, I'm not an expert on Azerbaijani society. Um, so forgive me if I, if I may speak here and I, I might not be totally accurate in what I'm saying, but my understanding is that um, when uh, a woman gets married in Azerbaijan, uh, prevailing customs are that she moves in with her husband's family 
Um, it's a multi-generational household and the mother-in-law is very influential in what that bride has access to or what she can do. In some cases, um, she doesn't get to leave the house um, or has very supervised um, uh, visits elsewhere. Um, so in a sense, the kind of networks that that person has access to change dramatically. Um, and so those informal kind of communal support networks are uh, maybe less accessible, they might be um, kind of even non-existent, um, or it depends, right? There, of course, is variability here, but speaking broadly, um, that's kind of the situation. Um, in terms of research questions, um, we were kind of just interested to see how this um, norm of sun preference um, was uh, apparent in um, this Facebook group how people thought about that norm um, and how people kind of came to terms with that. So uh, it was interesting that there was actually kind of a, a variety of opinions in this space. Um, people were very um, motivated by this. They're saying, how do I get pregnant with a boy? I really need a boy. Um, other people were like, yeah, I have a girl, but it's my first child, so it's okay. Kind of, I still have time. And other people were like, this is stupid. My husband wants a boy. I don't care as long as it's healthy. Um, I don't care what gender this child is as long as they're healthy and we can have more kids if we need to. I don't, I don't know why he's worried about this. Um, so there was a lot of kind of like normalization of that norm, but also room for dissent around that. Um, in thinking through kind of how people approached infertility um, and reproductive health issues, we saw that through kind of a patriarchal, patriarchal bargaining framework, which is to say there really wasn't um, reproductive autonomy in this space. And so people are trying to kind of navigate, okay, well, how do I increase my chances of conceiving a boy so I can satisfy this like requirement and get on with my life? Um, because once brides do have children, things can kind of change a little bit in terms of their power in the household, um, or that's my understanding at least. Um, and so we saw a kind of a big mix of information. Um, there was a lot of talk about sex selective abortion um, and opinions on that. And if you look at kind of the birth rates in Azerbaijan, I think that's borne out in those statistics as well, that that is something that people do to kind of try to conform to this um, uh, requirement um, of having a boy. Um, there was a lot of uh, kind of sharing of doctor information, right? Well, my doctor said this, my doctor said that, you can get this test. There was also a lot of like folk medicine in there. So things like um, if you bind your body very tightly for X number of days, that can increase your chances of conceiving a boy. Um, so a lot of, of a mix of the types and the kind of veracity of information um, being shared in this space is were also interesting to observe. So it was that, that was the kind of approach that we took. We wanted to see how these norms were expressed, how people thought about them and kind of what they did to try to meet this um, expectation. Well, thank you so much. I think that's all the time we have for today. And yeah, thank you all for coming and asking great questions and for the presentations. Bye-bye.